Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 30th of April 2014 in Willsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session four, part two. Why do we feel happy when we're on the natural love path mm -hmm. compared to feeling the feelings of sadness and unhappiness when we decide to get on the way? <laughs> I love this question because it's just so full of uh, like incorrect thinking and, and behaviour, I feel. <laughs> it's like amazing. Well, the reason why you're happy on the so-called natural love path is because you're full of addiction. <laughs> that are being met. Probably. That are being met, probably. Yeah. Well, if we're happy. Then, and you, if you're happy and you're not at one with God, then it means that you're full of addiction. Yeah. You, you're not really happy. You're just feeling happy because all of your addictions are getting met. That's why you feel happy. So basically what that question is telling me is the person who asked it, and by the way, we've been asked this question many times by many people. Yeah. Every person who asks it is totally in their addictions. And then when they get on the path to the way, the God's way, of course their addictions start getting confronted. Yeah. And for many people, they start becoming very unhappy about that. That's their anger-based response to their addictions being confronted. Yeah. And it's probably a normal response if we don't have a desire to love or to have truth or have humility. So if we had a desire to be loving, and receive God's love and had a desire for truth and receive God's truth and if we had a desire to be humble and be let others be humble we wouldn't feel that happy with the natural love path mm. and in fact we'd feel very happy about getting on the divine love path yeah. so it also tells us that the person asking these questions is not yet on the divine love path all that's happened is the divine love path has triggered their addictions mm -hmm. And they feel very unhappy and they're unwilling to give up their addictions. And so they want to go back to the natural love path so that they can have their addictions met again. Yeah. But, and by the way, the natural love path in the end doesn't meet all of your addictions. So this is the thing. They want to stay in the hells and, mm. and th think that they're happy, mm. which is very sad actually. Because a, a person who's in this much addiction is in the hells mm. and they want to stay in the hells rather than actually work through their addictions. And that's the crucial part, isn't it? Working through the addictions because as soon as we begin that work and we begin to have less addictions, while we might feel unhappy um, or uncomfortable while we're working through the addictions, no, I can't you agree. start to feel better though. Yeah, but I can't agree we'd even be unhappy, unhappy and uncomfortable working through our addictions. It's a relief to actually see your addictions. Yeah. When you, tr when you are desire truth and desire love, you're relieved to see what your addictions are that are causing you to be unhappy. Unhappy and damaging others. And, and in fact, it's a beautiful process to, to actually feel, you actually feel happy. So if you're not happy on the path on the way, yeah. then it's because you're unwilling to actually look at any of your addictions. And, and are living in a state of rebellion against the truth that has been presented to you, would you say Of course, that? every person yeah. who wants to live in their addictions is living in a state of rebellion yeah. to truth. Yeah. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to love. Mm -hmm. They're in rebellion against love as well. Mm. They don't want to love. They're in rebellion against humility. They don't want to be humble. And so while we're in rebellion to those things, we can't say that we're on the way. We're definitely not on the way. Because the way, by definition, is when we desire love. We Correct. desire truth. We desire to be humble. Correct. Yeah. So we're not yet on the way. And that's the reason why we find it so painful, because yeah. we really don't want it. Yeah. And we want to go back to the nice way that we had before, which was all about feeding our sleazy addictions. Yeah. And we love that. Yeah. And we need to be honest with that. Yeah. We need to see our addictions as sleaze. Yes. From, you know, there are methods of manipulating our and controlling our environment mm -hmm. and our own emotions. So that's pretty sleazy. Yeah. And, and we need to see them as such and go, OK, I don't want to do that anymore. And once you start actually having a feeling you don't want to do that anymore, you'll love the path. Yeah. You'll love the way that God's created. You, you'll enjoy it, actually. 
Like, when I look at the two paths, I go, how can you enjoy the natural love path? You call it the natural love path, and it's not even natural love path that you're enjoying. You're just enjoying your addictions. Because yeah. the reality is, spirits who have to progress on the natural love path find it very confronting to progress because they have to still confront their addictions. Yes. They just don't have to confront as many mm -hmm. as the person who's on the path to God. Mm -hmm. Because remember I've said in previous answers that the injuries we have surrounding God are much more extreme and, and also in terms of percentage, much higher percentage than the injuries we have with anything else. Mm -hmm. For that reason, we're going to find the injuries we have with God more confronting and difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. right? But a person who's on the natural love path still has to confront all of their injuries about love and truth and humility with regard to natural love. And most of them find that extremely painful, far more painful than a person who's on the path to God. Mm. Because the, the beauty of being on the path to God is you receive some of God's love while you're doing it. And that's what takes away a lot of this pain that everybody thinks they're in all the time. <laughs> right? yes. The reason why you're in pain all the time is because you're not on the path. Yes. Right? You're not on the path yet because you haven't given up any of your addictions. You're just in rebellion about giving up your addictions. Mm. So, so honour that. Yeah. Tell yourself the truth about that and then get through that. Because that's the discomfort, isn't it? It's, that's what prolongs the, the discomfort even, is staying in the state of rebellion. Correct. Once we get out of that, we go, oh, this is a mess. I've got to do a clean up. But it doesn't <laughs> feel so bad because you know no, how to clean it up. You know how to clean it up and you're starting to clean it up. So you, you're feeling better as you continue in the cleanup. Yeah. And you can look back in six months and go, I've oh, progressed. I've I progressed. can feel it. I can feel more love. I'm being more loving with my neighbour, my friends, my family. I'm being more truthful with my neighbour, my friends, my family, with God, with myself. I'm, I'm feeling more of my emotions. So I feel my humility growing. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you? Like, I don't understand <laughs> these statements sometimes because they, but they, they do come from people who have not experienced the way. Yes. So it's almost like they're, they're a person who, who's in their addictions commenting about the way. Yes. They haven't yet got on the way no. because once they get on the way, they won't like their addictions anymore. No. And they'll want to d get rid of them and they'll love when they can get rid of them. A person who asks a question like this doesn't want to get rid of their addictions. They love their addictions. And the so-called natural love path is not the natural love path at all that they're describing. They're just getting their addictions met. And the majority of paths on the earth meet a lot of addictions of people. And none of them are natural love because when they arrive in the spirit world, they'll arrive in the hells of the spirit world and they'll still have to learn about love and it, they're still going to find it painful. And, and they're still going to have to confront all of these addictions. Yeah. But, but just not as many as addictions as they will have to confront connecting to God. Mm. That's all. Mm. <laughs> so and I feel there's a lot of false beliefs uh, that people have about... They sort of have this viewpoint that they're not going to have to confront addictions and therefore not going to have to feel pain if they're on the natural love path. That's not all. That's not the case at all. If you're on the natural love path as it truthfully is you will have a lot of pain in your progress. Mm. You will have a lot of pain in your progress mm -hmm. and you'll be without God going through it. That's the reality. The majority of people on earth who think they're on the natural love path are not on natural love path at all. They don't know anything about love at all. They are in their codependent addictions, which is not love. Yeah. And, and then when those addictions don't get met, they get all upset. Yeah. And that's an indication that they don't know how to love. Mm. Right? And that's not the natural love path. No. So don't assume that you staying in your addictions and feeling all happy is the natural love path because it is not. Yes. It is just a spiritual process, like so-called claim to spirituality yeah. process, that's feeding your addictions. Yeah. And, and you love it. We can't call it natural love then, no, as you said. No, not at all. And yeah. Because the true natural love paths are paths that are actually learning about love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they improve in love. And they're not in codependent addiction. No. <laughs> and there are many, there are many things on the, on the planet that are dedicated to some form or some growth in natural love, but many um, kind of spiritual pursuits are that all people label addictions. with natural love 
labels yes. uh, do They're not, not natural love have at any all. love or any growth in love within yeah. them. Yeah. And the reality is that a person who's never heard of God on this planet, never heard of any na so-called natural love path, yeah. never heard of any new age mystical thing, yes. never heard of any religion, is often in a far better condition because they are not tainted, their love isn't tainted by any of those concepts or ideas. Yes. And so they are on the natural love path. Yes. Yes. They are on the natural love path more than any of all these other people are. <laughs> yeah. And when they pass into the spirit world, they pass into a better condition. That's what it was like for Frederick in the book Through the Mist, if, yes. we, if we've read that book. He did not have a religion that he adhered to. He practised love in his day-to-day -day life. He often felt sad and he went through his sadness, but he practised love in his day-to-day -day life. He, he longed for truth mm -hmm. in his day-to-day -day life. He was a man who was on the natural love path. Yes. He arrived at the top of the first sphere as a result. Yeah. The, his, his countrymen, most of them, all think they're following a religion, all think they are doing the right thing, they all think they believe in the right thing, they have no natural love development inside of them or very little natural love development inside of them, and so they arrive in the hells. Yeah. And then yeah. they have to progress in yeah. love. Yes. And, and then to assume that progress on the natural love path doesn't involve pain is completely incorrect. Nat progress on the natural love path involves the most pain of all. <laughs> yeah. The most yeah. pain of all. Yeah. Because on the divine love path, you're receiving some of God's love and so there's less pain. Yes. Right? But on the natural love path, you're not receiving God's love and so it's going to involve the most pain of all. Mm -hmm. The majority of people on this earth are not on that path yet. Yes. They will only get on that path sometime in their future. So they're not even on the natural love path. They're in their codependent addictions and that's what makes them feel happy. Yeah. And it, it, we, we've got to yeah. emphasise that. I am, I am tired of people saying to me, oh, I've been on the natural love path and it was all good. No, you've never been on the natural love path because you're totally unloving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just have had all of your addictions fed yeah. and that's what felt good. Yeah. And, that, and don't call that the natural love path because if you were really on the natural love path, you would have felt a lot of pain yeah. that you haven't felt yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, obviously when people, it's, I find it quite amazing how people sometimes analyse all of these different things. They s seem to analyse these things through their filters of belief and, and it's totally incorrect. So, so in future, for all of those of you, of you who question me about the natural love path, mm. please understand that it's going to involve more pain than you've ever experienced in your entire life, <laughs> right, if you're really on it. And, and honestly, if you're on the divine love path, you're going to have less pain through the process because God's going to help you with your pain. And if you are happy on the so-called natural love path, you're not on any love path. You're not on any love path at all. You've never even got on a love path at this point. You're just in your codependent addictions and you're wanting your environment to meet your addictions. And that's all you're on. Yeah. And, and while you're there, you're not on a love path at all. Mm. So don't call it one. <laughs> you know, call it what it really is. My codependent addiction path. <laughs> My selfish narcissistic path, which is really what it is. Well, that's how we are when we live in addiction, isn't Correct, it? Correct, yeah. yeah. So if we feel we're happy when we no longer get, uh, you know, when we no longer listen to divine truth, we haven't gone back to a natural love path. Mm. We've gone back to no path at all. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's reality. Yes, mm. thank you. <laughs> how do I know what are actually my feelings? Well, this is, I feel, a quite a good question, actually, yeah. because um, there are a number of different factors to it. Firstly, most of us are so detuned from our own feelings that we actually hardly feel our own feelings at all. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're even more sensitive to the feelings of other people than we are to our, than to our own feelings. Yeah. In addition, we have spirits surrounding us. And if we're sensitive or open to other people's feelings, we're also going to be very open to the feelings of people we can't see. So it's very difficult then to determine what are my feelings, what are the feelings of other people with me, and what are the feelings of other spirits with me? Yeah. And how do all of these things all mix up together? So it is very, very hard sometimes to know mm. what your feelings are when you're so desensitised to your feelings. Mm. The only way you're going to be able to discover what your own feelings are 
is to become more sensitive to your own feelings mm -hmm. and also to become more sensitive to feelings in general. Mm -hmm. So what happens to a lot of people is they try to desensitize the, to themselves to the feelings of others. But that's not the way of finding out whether things are your own feelings or other people's feelings or not there at all. Because when you desensitize one aspect of your soul, you're attempting now to suppress every aspect. And that's the principle of suppression. Yeah. So if a person looks at our human soul, how the human soul functions, FAQs, and listens about the principle of suppression, they'll learn that if you suppress one aspect of your soul, then automatically lots of other aspects of your soul are, automatic, uh, are suppressed. Whether you like it or not. Whether you happens. like it or not. Yeah. So what you're really doing when you suppress one aspect of your soul, for example, your sensitivity to other people's emotions, is that you're also suppressing your own sensitivity to your own emotions. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about that if you're going to choose to do that. If you do one, the other will automatically happen. Mm -hmm. Also, if you choose to become desensitized to your own emotions in order to control them, yeah. you will automatically become insensitive to other people's emotions. Mm. So the only real way of finding out what you yourself are feeling yeah. is by becoming open to the concept that you need to become more sensitive yeah. to your own emotions yeah. and feelings. Yeah. And once you become more sensitive to emotions and feelings, you will know the source of those feelings. Yeah. You will know whether those feelings are coming from you, whether they're coming from other people with you, mm -hmm. or whether they're coming from spirits that are with you mm. quite easily. Mm -hmm. But only the more sensitive you become to your own feelings yeah. will that occur. And that's the only way that you can actually become more sensitive to and, feel, to f and to feel your own feelings. So when I began the process in this life again, I was very desensitized to my own feelings. It was rare for me to feel my own feelings. As a result, I was often confused when I was interacting with others because I couldn't tell what their feelings were either. Yeah. I couldn't... I couldn't I couldn't feel their feelings properly and I couldn't feel their intentions. Whereas now that I've sensitized myself to the feelings and God's love being receiving, God's love obviously helps you sensitize yourself to feelings. Yes. It softens up your heart to yeah. feelings. Once that happens, you become more sensitive to everyone's feelings around you. You know what they're feeling. You know what they're thinking even. You know the emotions they're holding on to and suppressing, you even know where they came from. And you also know the same about yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know the same about spirit, with spirits you can't, people you can't even see, spirits. You know the same sort of information. And so this is going to help you immensely in your life determining what's the right course of action in any situation. Mm -hmm. Because you will know, because you're sensitive emotionally, the feelings of everybody in the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what we need to do basically in answer to this question is learn how to become more sensitive to our own feelings. Yeah, because the, the question could actually be asked two ways, couldn't mm -hmm. it? How do I know what are actually my feelings? Like, so how do it could be read, how do I know what my feelings are? Correct. Or how do I know what are my feelings in as versus opposed other people. to other people? And the answer to both questions is the same. Yeah by becoming more sensitive to feelings. Yes. So that's how you know. Yeah. And it's not about using your intellect. It's not about, you know, trying to use your mind to work out where it's coming from, what's going on. That will automatically occur once you're more sensitive to your feelings. So the key is to open up to the sensitivity of your feelings. And how do we do that? Well, we've talked many times about that. There's hundreds yeah. of questions we've ca carried about that. But primarily, again, there's three ways. You become open to being loved and wanting to love. Yeah. You become open to receiving truth and wanting truth. Yeah. And you become open to your own emotions. Yeah. And you do this with God. Mm -hmm. And that's how you be, and if you receive God's love, you will become very soft very rapidly and you'll change quite markedly. And as a result, you'll be very sensitive to everybody's feelings, including your own. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> do we need to think about a situation in order to get in contact with the feelings associated with that situation? Well, it's interesting the words chosen in this question. The, quest the words chosen is, do we need to think about a situation yes. in order to get in contact with the feelings of the situation? Now, if we had changed those words to, if we want 
to feel about the situation, we will get in <laughs> to feeling the feelings about the situation. You see, you see, the whole concept of needing to do something yep. is usually driven by an underlying desire that you don't really want mm -hmm. to do it, but right. you feel that you have to. That you must. You know. feel you must. Yeah. So yes, the answer to this question is yes, of course. You do need to think about a situation in order to get in contact with the feelings about the situation. Because if you don't think about the situation, yes. if you don't want to think about the situation, you will already be in denial emotionally of the situation and therefore unable to feel the feelings associated with the situation. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that you're saying the fact that we're not already thinking about it means that we want to suppress it. Correct. Yep. And, we're and even asking ourselves the question, do I need to mm -hmm. do something, is telling me that I don't want to. Yes, I see what you're right? saying. Yeah. And what I'm saying to people is that unless you want to feel about a situation, you will not think about the situation. <laughs> it's all very <laughs> intellectual. Um, what about times when you know you just have a feeling, mm -hmm. you, you attract something and you find yourself grieving or shaking or, or whatever, you're having an emotional response that's yes. obviously related to a situation that's not the one in front of you. No, but the one in front of you has triggered you. Yes. So you're thinking about that situation. You're allowing the thought of that situation. Okay, yes. You see I what see I'm what saying? saying yes. so, so a person starts feeling when they allow the thought of a situation. Unfortunately, most of the time, they only allow the thought of the current situation, yeah. the one that's triggered them. Yeah. They don't allow the thought of all the situations in their history yeah. that have triggered the same emotion yeah. that they stored. Yeah. So this is part of our problem. And the reason why they don't allow the thought of all of these situations in the past that have triggered this same emotion is because they don't want to. Mm -hmm. So yes, they need to, mm -hmm. but they don't want to. So mm -hmm. needing to doesn't help you. No. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get to the point where you want to, yeah. where you want to feel about the situations and want to think about them. So in other words, many of us have many childhood situations that we want to forget. We do need to remember them, mm -hmm. but we want to forget them. So what's going to happen? We're going to forget them. Yeah. And until such a point in time that we want to remember them, yeah. that will remain. Now, the law of attraction is going to bring us events that cause us to trigger the memory of those situations. So in other words, there'll be something that happens in the current day which will cause us to remember a similar situation that happened in our past. Mm -hmm. But if I want to forget it, obviously I will not get to it. Yeah. And, I, and so, yes, you do need to, but the real question is not, should I need to? It's, I need to know how to want to. Yeah. How do I, how do I change the want to? That's the real question. Because we've spoken in other discussions recently about how the... Thought, thoughts are driven by emotions. So mm. if we're not naturally thinking about something or if we're invested in avoiding thinking of something, then there's an emotion... Saying, I don't want to think Saying, I don't it. want to. So that's what you're saying we need to deal with. Correct. Yep. So, so rather than worrying about whether I need to think about something, mm -hmm. I need to ask myself the question, why don't I want to think about it? that would be more productive. Mm. Your problem with asking or telling myself that I need to do something is quite often all that does is remind me of how resistive I am to doing <laughs> this. <laughs> and feel like it's a duty. And, and feel like it's a duty. Yeah. And then just feel really blur. Yeah, yeah, and feel like someone else is manipulating you and controlling you. Yeah. And, and, you know, often it's your own definitions of what's right and wrong, manipulating, controlling you, but you feel like you have to do something when you don't really want to do it. It's a bit, it's a li it's a bit like a man, you, you know, you, you often hear of these situations where the man's walking down the street and he checks out a woman, even though he's walking alongside his wife, right? And he's mm -hmm. checking out another woman. Well, he wants to. Now, he might think, oh, it's terrible I did that. I need to change. Yeah. But does he want to? And if he really wants to, he'll find out why. He does Why that. He did it. Yeah. What, what inside of him causes him to feel drawn to do that? Yeah. He'll want to do that. Yeah. So he'll want to think about those situations. He won't feel that he has to. Mm -hmm. He won't feel like he needs to. He'll feel like he wants to. Yeah. And this is what we need to do in all these things. 
when we go, I need to, we're not really changing anything in our soul. Mm. Once we start feeling like we want to, and not telling ourselves we want to, but feeling like we want to, things change very rapidly. Yeah. And this is the main reason why most people don't change, is because they're trying to do the need, what they think they need to do, but they're not working on why they don't want to do it. And what I suggest to people instead, work on why you don't want to do the right thing. Yeah. Work on why you don't want to love, why you don't want to give love, why you don't want to receive it, why you don't want to hear the truth, why you don't want to tell the truth. Work on why you don't want to be humble to your emotions and why you don't want to let other b people be humble to theirs. Mm -hmm. Work on that. Because when you work on why you don't want to, you will eventually want to. Yeah. And then when you want to, things will change. But if you keep telling yourself, I have to, or I need to, nothing will change. Mm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Why does life often feel so helpless and empty? Yeah, so I find this question, it was quite sad to read the question because I can feel the emotions of the person who wrote it and they do feel that their life is helpless and empty. Hopeless and empty. Helpless it is actually. Yeah, I might have misspoken. Hopeless. Yeah, yeah, and empty. And so what I would like to do is just talk about some of the reasons why that's the case. Firstly, if our life feels hopeless and empty or helpless and empty, the first reason why is we're not feeling love. Mm. So we're not f open to feeling God's love and we're not open to loving ourselves. So, so there is an issue with our belief systems. There is an issue with what we believe in. When we believe in things that are false and we accept the false as true, in other words, we accept the false masquerading as truth, we often feel hopeless, helpless and empty. Mm. When we start accepting the truth, we start to feel very hopeful. And, and this, is a sub this is the result of this beautiful connection with God that we can develop. It can give us hope, hope that we didn't have before. And in particular, hope that there is love, that, there, that love is available to us and we can experience it. So people who feel helpless, empty and, uh, and hopeless are often also feeling unloved. Mm. And uh, they feel that nobody cares about them and nobody loves them, which is not actually not true. The truth is that God cares about them and loves them. They probably also have a spirit guide who cares about them and loves them. The problem is that they just can't feel them. Mm. So the real problem is that they are blocked to the reception of love. Mm. So a person who is in this condition needs to open themselves to the reception of love. Mm -hmm. And often they are very resistive to doing so. They also need to open themselves to the reception of truth. And they are often also very resistive to doing that. Mm -hmm. In other words, they wish to remain in a hopeless or helpless condition because they don't want to have to make a personal effort to get out of that condition. Mm -hmm. They want somebody else to come along and rescue them from that condition. Mm -hmm. Now, God waits for us to desire to get out of a condition before he sends someone to our rescue. So unless there is a real desire in us to get out of that condition, we will not be rescued from that condition. So we need to ask ourselves whether we sincerely wish to get out of that condition or we have become addicted to feeling hopeless and helpless and empty mm -hmm. as a way of avoiding our life mm. and a way of avoiding our experience and a way of avoiding ourselves and the environment in which we live. Yeah. And most people who feel these emotions are avoiding those four things. So what I would recommend to people who are feeling these particular feelings is to focus firstly on the fact that there is love available to, for them from God and also from their spirit guide, even if no one else on earth loves them. Right? There is truth available to them if they want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But they're going to have to exercise a desire to get out of this addiction to feeling helpless and hopeless and a desire to know the truth. They're going to have to exercise a personal effort. They can't wait until somebody comes and rescues them because nobody will rescue them until they have a desire to get out of their condition. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage them to do those things. Mm. 
Now, usually that is, again, an exercise of will. Mm -hmm. When we are addicted to being feeling hopeless or helpless or addicted to feeling like nobody is going to come and rescue us and nobody really cares, there are usually very strong addictions that we have mm -hmm. that we need to give up. And oftentimes we're very unwilling to give them up. So one of the things we will need to focus on is why is it that we wish to hold on to these concepts of the world and why is it we wish to believe something that is not true? Mm. Because God, the greatest being in the universe, loves us and therefore we are loved. Yeah. And therefore nothing is hopeless or helpless and we don't need to feel empty. Yeah. So I would encourage people to examine why they feel addicted to such emotions rather than actually being open to the reception of the truth, which is that God really does love them. God's got an immense amount of truth that God wants to share with them. And once they receive that truth, they're going to feel very hopeful. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to be in a position not only to help themselves, but help others. Yeah. And they won't feel empty ever again. Yeah, I know from my own experience, uh, when I feel empty, it's usually because I've gone into so much suppression in avoidance of deep fears and terrors Correct. Uh, that I just, I don't believe, I have the false belief that I can't handle. And so I suppress, the effort required in suppressing that suppresses absolutely everything, everything else. <coughs> mm -hmm. And it is empty. It feels like an empty existence because there is no mm. energy in motion. There's no emotion flowing anywhere. But let's, instead of focusing on what it feels like, yeah. let's focus on what caused it. Which, is Which was, as you said, the desire to suppress mm -hmm. some emotion. Mm -hmm. So a person often feels hopeless, helpless and empty because they desire to suppress how they really feel. They don't want to feel the pain mm -hmm. of how they really feel. Yeah. So they prefer hopeless, helpless and empty. Yeah. This is why I say it's an addiction. Yes. Because it's yes. a way, a method that we use to avoid more painful emotions. Yeah. And a person who's going through these particular things needs to be honest about this as an addiction mm. and see it as an addiction rather than seeing it as some kind of external thing that's going to change, that's going to cause them to get out of that condition. Yeah. So to recap what you've said, mm -hmm. you said feeling helpless, hopeless and empty. Is an addiction. It's an addiction. Yes. It, also, it comes from a belief in things that are false. It comes from believing things that are not true. That are not true. You know, and particularly believing things about love that are not true. That are not true. And so there's a, this lack of desire to feel love, to feel unloved, to feel all of these emotions surrounding love. Yes. You mentioned. And to face the truth about love. Face the truth that you weren't loved in mm -hmm. your childhood, but also face the truth that God loves you. Yes. That there's two truths there, you know, yeah. that you need to face. You might not have been loved by people on earth, but God loves you. Mm -hmm. So somebody does love you and you need to be open to that truth. Most people aren't open to that truth who yeah. feel these emotions yeah. because they want to not feel an emotion. Yeah. They don't want to feel the pain of not being loved. Yeah. So that's why these emotions are addictions. They're not real emotions. Yeah. They're not causal emotions. They are emotions that we create because we wish to avoid causal emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, great. So it's about addiction and avoidance, really. Yes. Yeah. And while I have compassion for people who feel hopeless, helpless and empty, and I have in the past gone through those emotions mm -hmm. to an extreme degree, I had to come to terms with the fact that it was all about me wanting to hold on to certain addictions where I wanted to believe nobody cared, nobody loved me and, and yeah. so forth. <laughs> And also I was unwilling to feel True. when certain people yeah. didn't love me. Yeah. I was unwilling to feel the grief associated with that, the grief of loss, if mm. you like. And I, once I worked through the grief of loss and the grief, uh, and also worked through receiving the truth that God st still loved me, yeah. then I got out of the hopeless, helpless feelings yes. and I no longer felt empty. Yeah. I, I felt positive and I felt like I had something to live for. Yeah, and that's a fantastic example for everyone. Yeah. The fact that you've done that. Yeah, yeah. and I feel that there are many people who will be attracted in the future to divine truth who do feel initially hopeless, helpless and empty. Mm -hmm. But uh, that if they follow my advice and, and instead, of, instead of getting angry about it, <laughs> um, they will find that they'll be able to see it as an addiction 
yeah. and start to recognise the truth about, you know, the fact that they are loved mm -hmm. and also recognise the truth that they need to just feel some pain. They need to let themselves feel some pain. Mm -hmm. And if they let themselves feel and become sensitive to this pain, they'll actually feel also some pleasure. Because mm -hmm. at the moment when we go into this heavy suppression, which is a person who feels these emotions always goes into, they are suppressing every part of the soul. Yeah. So you're not going to feel pleasure or pain once you start suppressing your pain. Yeah. And this is a principle that people need to keep in mind. Yeah. And, and I'd suggest that people who are listening to this answer need to examine how the human soul functions and particularly look at the areas of suppression mm -hmm. because it's the area of suppression that causes us to go into these states where we feel hopeless, helpless and empty which are addictive states to uh, assist us in the suppression mm -hmm. and help, it helps us avoid the deep pain that's underneath the suppression. Yeah. We need to go into this pain and release it if we're ever going to be happy and hopeful. <laughs> And have a full life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from someone called John. And he asks, It seems to me that it is my will that holds my attention in my body when it desperately wants to escape out into some addiction, spirit or thought. Mm -hmm. Is not therefore any practice that strengthens my will helpful to eventually hold my attention in my body when it wants to escape, when intense emotions are rising. Mm -hmm. And is this not why those who get to the sixth sphere on thought control alone mm -hmm. and then go back to the third when they start feeling their emotions, then progress more rapidly than those who haven't first learned thought control? because they've developed a certain strength of will to hold their attention in their body. The will directs the attention, focus, mm -hmm. as the neck turns the head, eyes. Which is why God called rebellious Israel stiff-necked. <laughs> yes. I have to explain that reference because sure. I don't know it. Sure. The question is, mm -hmm. does not the natural love pass mm -hmm. or thought control requiring a great deal of will, then become helpful in eventually holding the attention on causal emotions. Yes, uh, well, John, you're pretty, it's a pretty complicated question and I need it to is. go through the question with you because there are quite a number of false beliefs that you have about the use of the will coming from the intellect, for example, and also about progression from the sixth sphere into the divine love path. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's quite a lot of false beliefs about what the natural love path actually is. Yeah. So, so in addition to that, you have some truth <laughs> mixed yeah. in with all of your question as well. Uh -huh. And so what we'd like to do is dissect it a bit so that we can dissect what's truthful and what isn't. Firstly, let's focus on the natural love path. Quite often people are referring to the natural love path as an exercise of the intellect. No, the natural love path is a lo path of learning how to love, mm -hmm. naturally. <laughs> In other words, learning how to love from your soul. Learning how to love other people and learning how to love yourself. So while God is not involved on the natural love path, the love is definitely involved mm -hmm. and therefore the emotions are also involved in learning how to love. So people who learn how to love and progress on the natural love path will progress. A per if a person does not learn how to love, it does not matter how much they use their intellect, they will not progress on the natural love path. As I've said in previous answers to previous questions, they're not on any path at all mm -hmm. towards love. So using your intellect doesn't mean you're on the natural love path because you can use your intellect and not be on any path at all mm -hmm. when it comes to love. So we need to make sure there is a separation between <coughs> our concept of the intellect and our concept of the natural love path. Mm -hmm. The natural love path is all about learning how to love. It doesn't involve God, but it certainly does involve learning how to love from your heart people around you and learning how to receive love and learning how to give love to yourself. Yep. So it's an essential part 
of your progress, whether you, whether you progress towards God or not. If you want to be happy, you're going to have to learn how to love. And it, while it may involve your intellect, it is not the result of the involvement of your intellect. It is the result of you learning and feeling love. Uh -huh. That's how you progress on the natural love path. Yeah. So we, know, we need to be very specific about that. Secondly, there is a misinterpretation in his question about the use of will. Mm -hmm. John is basically suggesting that the use of your will comes from your intellect, mm -hmm. and that is not true. The will is, a, is an expression of the soul, yeah. and the intellect is just a tool that the soul uses to express its will. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the use of will is a soul development tool. Mm -hmm. It's not an intellectual development tool. Mm -hmm. It's not something we can intellectually develop either. And yes, a person who progresses intellectually in love and finishes up growing in love without God is having to have an extreme use of their will to do so mm -hmm. over many, usually hundreds, if not thousands of years. So, of course, they do now know how to use their will. Uh -huh. That is true. So there is development. There in is developed the in the soul yes. of the use of will. Mm -hmm. And the use of will has to be developed whether you're on the natural love path or on the path to God. You must learn how to use your will properly. Well, on that point, I can use my will to shut down my emotions you really can. strongly and I can develop the use of my will in that way. That's not going to help me though because... It may help you if you shut down the emotions that are negative in the use of your will in the sense of how you become more expressive with your love. Oh yeah, no, I'm Do sorry. I I'm mean, saying? it's not going to help me when I then decide that I want to focus on causal emotions. My will is already, it's not, will is not a tool that we just put a task in front of and say, go do that it thing. It can be, it, it can okay. be. So it can be a tool that you put a task in front of and say, this is how I wish to use my will. Yes, mm -hmm. it can be. Mm -hmm. And that is a soul-based function. So the, the use of your will is a soul-based function. It mm -hmm. is a feeling that comes with it. And when the feeling is there, your will will be very strong. So, for example, if you have a strong feeling, and many spirits who are on the natural love path develop a very strong feeling that they want to love, Mm -hmm. They learn, usually by the time they've passed into the second dimension, the second sphere of the spirit world, they've learnt that the way to progress is to become more loving. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they feel that they want to love. They, they, they want to love. And that's coming from their soul. It's not coming from their intellect. Yes. So what they now do is they now use their intellect to suppress the emotions that cause them to be unloving mm -hmm. and highlight the emotions that cause them to be loving. Mm -hmm. So they're basically using their intellect to select their emotions. Mm -hmm. And as they do that, the emotions that they deny the expression of get pushed aside and, and pushed down. Mm -hmm. So therefore they become less powerful. And the emotions they allow to go, which are all to do with emotions regarding love, they allow to be expressed. And so what happens naturally is there is this sort of uh, widening gap between the emotions they no longer allow because they know they're unloving and the emotions they allow because they know they're loving. Mm -hmm. And so they are actually progressing in the soul, not I with their intellect. They yes. are using their intellect to progress, but there is actual soul progression in love. Mm -hmm. The only reason why they've gotten to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth and sixth dimension is because there has actually been a soul progression in love, mm -hmm. not because they've used their intellect to love, mm. that there has to have been a soul progression in love. Yeah. But it's a soul progression in this one aspect of love and or the, the, the aspects of natural love. In other words, the love that comes out of them towards other people and the love that they allow from other people into them and the love that they have for themselves. They have grown in the expression of those particular things and become more loving naturally in those things. So when they've reached the sixth sphere, they at least know what it means to be loving to other people. You see, the average person who's in the first sphere doesn't know that. They don't know what it means to be loving to other people. Yeah. They have no idea. So the average person who hears about divine love or natural love in the first sphere has no idea what's being talked about because mm -hmm. in both cases they just think it's addiction that's being talked about. 
And so they have a, a deep confusion about love. Whereas a spirit who's progressed to the sixth dimension does no longer confused about natural love. They are completely in harmony with the expression of natural love in their soul. Not just in their mind, but in their soul. They love being loving to other people. They love being loving to themselves. Mm -hmm. They have a desire in their heart to do so. Yeah, so their soul has progressed. So their soul has progressed. Yep. And their soul has progressed using different techniques than what we would normally use if we we're on the path to God. But it's still progressed. Right? Even though it might have taken many hundreds or thousands of years, it has still progressed. The soul has actually had to make changes in love. Right? Yep. And that has not, while it's been helped by the intellect, it has not been controlled or forced by the intellect because there has to have been things that have happened inside of the soul to make the change. And the use of their will is one of those things. They've had to exercise a very strong will to actually no longer feel and act upon emotions that are unloving and to only feel and act upon emotions that are loving. Mm -hmm. So this is where they're still harming themselves in a way because they're suppressing a whole group of emotions. Yeah. But they're at least acting upon the emotions that are loving, which they was, was not what they were doing when they're in the first sphere or in the hells, or probably when they were on earth. Yeah. They're having to act in harmony with love. They're wanting to love. So it's like a person here on earth deciding, well, I want to love animals, so I'm not going to eat meat anymore. Now, even though they may have a feeling they want to eat meat, mm -hmm. They've decided with their intellect that it's not loving to eat meat because that's not loving to animals. And they want to love, so they use their will, which is actually a function of the soul, yeah. to force themselves to eat a certain way so that they become more loving. And in the process of that, they forget what it's like to eat meat. Mm -hmm. And so eating of meat becomes a forgotten practice. And, they, and sometimes, though, there'll be emotions associated with eating meat, which makes them smell the meat or whatever, and they go, oh, I'd like some of that. But, but it's a fleeting thing. It, they, they, it passes away because of their strong desire, their strong use of their will, that they want to do the right thing, do the loving thing. Mm -hmm. And you do have to exercise that kind of willpower, whether you're on the divine love path or on the natural love path. Mm. You must develop the exercise of your will. Yeah, and that's, I suppose, what I'm finding interesting is the idea that we can develop will and that is distinct from the emotions that, m that motivate will. Correct, That, it's that not. is a quality within <laughs> itself, Correct. the development of will. And these come and from the soul, so therefore they are driven by emotions. So the development of will is not an intellectual process. It can be assisted by your intellect but it's not an intellectual process. There's going to have to be changes in your soul for your will to be fully engaged. Specifically related just to the use of will, not yes. necessarily about how you want to use your will. Correct. Mm. It's just, so uh, the reality is that some people on earth who use their will in terribly uh, vindictive and, and evil ways, once they learn divine truth, they then use their will to the same extreme in yes. that. Yes. And they, so they progress very rapidly yeah. because they are used to using their will in this very powerful manner. Mm. Right? And then there's other people on earth uh, who, who basically go, oh, I don't really care, like, I don't really care about anything. They never use their will at all. And often they take years, hundreds, thousands of years to progress because they're not used to engaging the use of their will, yeah. either negatively or positively. Yeah. They just are like, apathetic. And as a result of their apathy, they have no developed will. Mm -hmm. They don't know. And they go along with whatever anybody suggests to them as a result. And that's how they live the rest of their life, yeah. going along with everything without doing anything. It's the people who powerfully use their will who find progression the easiest. Right? So you've got to powerfully engage the operation of your will, whether you're on the natural love path or on the divine love path. In you, if you're on the natural love path, you will powerfully engage your will to become a loving person with the way, way you express and receive love towards yourself and others. If you're on the divine love path, you will powerfully use your will to engage this loving relationship with God as well as do what the person on the natural love path does, engaging their will to become more loving with other people. Mm -hmm. This is how you will engage your will. 
So now that we've clarified that yes. and we examine the question again, we can see where there's errors in the concepts. So it, John is saying, it seems to me that it is my will that holds my attention in my body. Yes, it is his will that yeah. holds his attention in his body. Yeah. And when it desperately wants to escape out into some addiction, some spirit interaction or thought, it's his will that keeps him back into the emotions that are present within him and into his body. Yeah. I agree. He says, is not therefore any practice that strengthens my will helpful to eventually hold my attention in my body? Yes, it is. Yeah. Anything that helps you strengthen the operation of your will is a soul-based progression. It is definitely going to help you to progress, even if you're going to feel, whether you want to feel emotions or not, it's going to help you progress. So can we talk about that in terms of ways to strengthen our will? Well, because I we feel that's a completely different question, perhaps. Okay. Like I feel we need to ask that maybe as the next question. Or like how do I strengthen my will is mm -hmm. a good question. Yep. And, and it needs to be answered directly. But I feel firstly we need to answer this question. We need to acknowledge, yes, that there are practices and any practice that helps you strengthen your will is definitely going to be helpful in your progression in love, whether that progression in love is on the natural love path or on the divine love path. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It will help you progress in love. Now, this is where he goes wrong with his reasoning. He says, and is this not why those who get to the sixth sphere on thought control alone? No, nobody gets to the sixth sphere on thought control alone. There must be a soul-based exercise of their will to become more loving to get to the sixth sphere. Yes. So it's a soul-based interaction to become more loving from a natural perspective, to become more loving with my brothers and sisters and with myself. Not loving with God, but loving with myself. And so, so the way I have got to the sixth fear is not by thought control alone, mm -hmm. but rather by using my will in a very strong way to deny all of my unloving emotions and, and engage all of my loving ones. That's what I've done to get to the sixth dimension. And so I have learned, if I've got to that stage, to use my will quite strong. Yes. Now, if I've used my will in that regard to feel emotion as well, then I am well tuned to receive information about God. But if I've used my will to deny certain emotions, I am going to find it very, very difficult to use my will to do the opposite thing because I've become addicted to, divide, to putting down emotion. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's n we can't presume that a person who's in the sixth sphere will find it easy to go back to the third sphere and then progress on the divine love path, because that is not the case at all. The majority of our emotional injuries revolve around God. So therefore, um, and also by the way, the all of those injuries are emotional. Yes. And if I'm used to denying the emotion rather than accepting it and receiving it and working my way through it, mm -hmm. or I'm used to denying God, I'm going to find switching over from the natural love path to the divine love path very, very difficult. You can't assume that every sixth sphere spirit finds it easy to go back to the third sphere and onwards. In fact, the majority I've spoken to find it almost impossible to do that. Mm -hmm. So we can't assume that they find it easy. Mm -hmm. However, they do have a very good exercise of their will. And when they do decide yes. to start feeling their emotion, and when they do decide to really give it a go. Yeah, but that's not a thought either. That's not a thought either, that's yeah. a feeling. Yeah. When they decide in their heart that they really want to do this and really want to give it a go, then they have a tendency to progress quite well. Yeah. No matter what their background, all right? And, and if they have the additional problem of not of suppressing their negative emotion, then they'll have a lot of difficulty unsuppressing those emotions. Mm -hmm. They'll have a lot of difficulty reversing what they've done for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. It is difficult to reverse those processes. And sometimes the only way to help them is to take them back to their life on earth. So they have a reconnection with some of those very hard and unloving things that happened to them in their earth life before they reconnect with some of those things emotionally. Yeah. So he says now, they've, because they've developed a certain strength of will to hold their attention in the body. Yes, they have, but it's not by thought control. Yes. It's by 
feeling control. They want to feel these things. They have a desire to feel these things that are so intense that they're willing to override certain feelings mm -hmm. in preference for loving feelings. Mm -hmm. they're, un they're willing to override unloving feelings and suppress them in preference to having loving feelings. Yep. Right? Of course, when they do this, they don't understand the law of suppression in the soul. Mm -hmm. And they also don't understand the law of dominance in the soul. The principles of dominance and suppression mean that if I suppressed, other emotions will be suppressed. So they don't feel pleasure as much as they could. Yep. In addition, because they, the uh, stuff we don't feel is dom dominating our soul, they don't realise how raw some of the emotions are that they've now suppressed. So they don't realise those things either and they have to come to terms with that. Yeah. And usually a person comes to terms with that in the third dimension or the third sphere. And so this is why they go back to the third sphere to learn those particular aspects of the soul. Mm -hmm. right. Now he's saying the will directs the attention, yes, but it's the will coming from the soul, not the mind as he's, as he's assuming. Yeah. Right? It's the will coming from the soul directs the attention and turns the neck if they, if they like. Um, now, the whole question about God calling rebellious if it was stiff neck was all about their arrogance and their pride and their mm. unwillingness to actually um, turn in another direction than mm. the direction they were already going. So in other, in other words, the comment made to the nation of Israel in the Bible was all about their lack of humility from yeah. God's perspective yeah. and not about the issue of their will. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Now, the question he's asking is, does not the natural love path or thought control? Now, he's now putting together natural love path and thought control. Do not do this. <laughs> natural love path is about progressing in love, yep. in your soul. Now, that you can use your thoughts to do so, but that has to also come from an exercise of the will in the soul to do so. Yep. So there are progressions that have to occur in the soul, even on the natural love path. Mm -hmm. So it's not just thought control. Now, of course, the natural love path has domin is dominated by people with lots of thoughts yep. as a result of this suppression and dominance processes. They are trying to suppress the dominant negative emotions. And so what they've got to use is an extreme amount of their will to control the thinking about their negative emotions. Yes. So now they do have to have some thought control, but that's not the reason why they got to the sixth sphere. Mm -hmm. They got to the sixth sphere because their soul actually changed yeah. in love. Yes. There was a feeling change inside of them about love. Mm -hmm. And that's what caused them to grow. Mm -hmm. So, so that obviously did require a great deal of will. Then he's asking whether the, whether the natural love path is helpful in eventually holding the attention on the causal emotions. No, it's not helpful. Mm. Because a person could have got there by suppressing attention on causal emotions. All he had to do was exercise his will to love, yes. not to feel everything. Yeah. That's all he had to do. So it doesn't mean then that he's guaranteed once he gets to the sixth dimension that he's going to find it easy to no longer suppress those emotions that he's been suppressing for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. He's going to find it hard yeah. to undo that suppression. Yes, because there's the will and then there's the other emotions that motivate the will. Correct. And so while the will might be strongly developed through this whole process that... To love. To love. The will is also strongly developed in the process to avoid any unloving emotion. Yes. So the reason the will is directed towards suppression has to change in order for the power of the will to be harnessed. Correct. Yeah. And this is why many six fear spirits find it very, very difficult. Yes. Because they're now having to exercise their will, which they've been exercising in one direction for many hundreds, if not thousands of years, mm -hmm. towards their cer certain types of emotions. They now have to exercise their will in a completely different direction with those same emotions. Yeah. And this is like, for, for, for many of them beginning that process, it's like trying to find a needle in the haystack. Of course, there's usually hundreds of suppressed emotions because the, most of the emotions we're suppressing when we're on the natural love path have to do with God. Mm -hmm. So there's all those emotions all festering within the soul, all causing the dominance of the will in a certain direction to be without God in your progression. Yeah. And, and all of those have to be undone if you want to progress towards God. Yeah. 
So this is where why six fear spirits find it very much more difficult than John is assuming. Yes. The reality is some six fear spirits, and it's those spirits who have not suppressed emotion so much, who will find it easier than the ones who have used a lot of controlled will mm -hmm. in order to suppress their negative, unloving emotions. The people who have used a lot of controlled will to suppress all of their negative and unloving emotions will find it very difficult to make the first steps on the path to God. Mm -hmm. And they always finish up reverting back to thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to convince a person to try an experiment when they want to talk about the experiment <laughs> all, <laughs> for the rest of their life. <laughs> yeah. And they don't want to try it because they don't see any advantage in trying it because they've never felt the advantage of trying it. Yeah. And it's, try it's like trying to get a person to be childlike and just have the experience and see what the results were without their intellect being engaged. And it's a very, very difficult process often to convince a six fear spirit to make that choice. Yeah. But it's a very, very good question for our six fear spirit friends. Yes. Because many of them will need to at some point go through this process where they now use their will no longer to suppress the unhealed negative emotions that are unloving, but rather to work through the reasons why those emotions still remain within their soul. Mm. And that requires, it does require an extreme amount of their will to do so. But many of them have used their will in positive directions in the past. Yeah. So there's no reason why they can't use their will in a positive direction with this particular aspect of the soul as well. Yeah. And just to recap, you've said the will originates in the soul and it's a not a thought control process. Correct. And it can so engage the thoughts, mm -hmm. but in the end, it has to begin with a desire in the soul. Yep. Yep. So we can't confuse the will or the natural love progression with the process of thought control. Correct. And they're, two com they're all completely independent things. Yep. So that's one thing. The second thing you've pointed out is that the development of will, the strengthening of will can be helpful when the motivation or when the emotions um, that motivate the will are in a positive direction or a direction Correct. towards God. So, so you could say that a person who's on the natural love path has used their will in a, in a partially positive direction in that they have used their will to become more loving towards themselves and to other people. That's a beautiful use of their will. Mm -hmm. But they haven't yet used their will to become in a relationship with God in a loving way. Yeah. So they haven't used their will in that direction. Yeah. Yep. They've also used their will to suppress their negative thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that they've used their will in a destructive way for their own soul. Yep. So gotcha. they have to undo those particular aspects of how they've used their will, yeah. which is often difficult if you've been doing that for many thousands of years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And probably the guts of John's question is really about feeling that strengthening his will, which he believes is thought control, is going to help him with his causal emotions. Yes. If he, if he understands that strengthening your will isn't about thought control, mm -hmm. it's about feeling the desire to strengthen your will in yeah. a certain direction. It's about a feeling that's happening from the soul. If he just focuses on that, yes, the answer to that question is yes. If you strengthen your will, and there are certain techniques that you can do, you can, there's all sorts of things you can do to strengthen your will. Uh -huh. um, if you strengthen your will, you'll do well on the divine love path because every person who's on the divine love path has to have a strong will <laughs> <laughs> just like every person on the natural love path has to have a strong will yeah because to, to become more loving you're going to have to use your will to do so mm. whether it be with god or with you know by yourself becoming more loving with the love that's coming out of yourself mm. so yes the use of will is extremely important but it's not thought control yeah. it, it is based upon feelings of want to use your will in that direction and having those feelings develop so strongly that they motivate your thoughts to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. How do we strengthen our will? Well, you'll notice with all of these discussions about emotions that we've had, all of them so far we've talked about a lot to talk about the use of our will. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense then that we're going to have to use our will in certain directions. If I first can mention the directions in which we need to use our will, if we're going okay. to progress in, towards God, 
we're going to need to use our will to receive God's love. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to use our will to give God love. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to use our will to, to receive love from others. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need to use our will to give love to others. We're going to need to use our will to become a more loving person. Mm -hmm. We're going to be needing to be using our will so that we receive more truth, so that we love truth. So seeking truth. We would need to use our will to seek truth. Yeah. We wouldn't want to oppose truth. We'd also want to use our will to tell the truth, to speak the truth, both to ourselves and to other people. We don't want to fool ourselves with lies, nor do we want to deceive other people with lies. So we'd want to tell the truth to ourselves and to others. And we'd have to use our will to do that. And we're going to have to use our will to become more humble individuals and even use our will to allow other people to be humble around us. So that's a lot of exercise of our will yeah. that we're going to need to engage. So the question then becomes, how do I engage my will mm -hmm. in appropriate ways? Well, there are a number of things that you need to do to engage your will, I feel. The first thing I feel is that at some point you need to see the benefits of doing so. And the only thing that really helps you see the benefits of doing so is hearing God's truth on a matter. So, so at some point, God's truth will convince us enough. It's like getting to know the truth about God and about the universe will convince us enough that we need to engage our will in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. It's like any relationship. So if I wanted to have a relationship with you and I just saw you over the other side of the, wheel, uh, of the room, yeah. I would have to use my will to walk over and speak with you yes. if I wanted to get to know more about you. Uh -huh. I would, if I wanted to love you and express my love towards you, I'd have to use my will to do so. Yeah. You would have to allow me to express that will in order to receive it. Yeah. Like, so if I wanted to give you a hug, you'd have to allow me to give you a hug, otherwise yeah. you wouldn't get one. Right? Yeah. So can you see there's a lot of ways in which we could use our will and, and I have to see the truth of it first. Mm -hmm. I have to see the truth that I need to take some personal action if I want to receive the benefits. There is no magical solution here where someone will come along and make my will change. It is my will. Yeah. I'm the person who will need to change it. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do I change it? Well, the first way to change it is by knowing or being open to receiving the truth about, an in, about something, particularly God's truth about something. About... Anything. Anything. Yep. So in any direction, let's say I wanted to hear, uh, you know, let's say I wanted to become more loving. I'd have to be open to hearing God's truth about love rather than the world's truth about love. Because the world's truth about love basically is it's going to cause you lots of pain. You're going to have lots of crying. It's going to be very, very hard. And somebody will probably leave you anyway. And at the end of it, all, it's probably hopeless. And, you know, most of us end up alone anyway. That's the world's truth about love. Mm -hmm. Well, that's completely opposite to God's truth about love. Now, if I believe the world's truth about love, am I ever going to really want to love? Probably not, because the world's truth about love is telling me there's a whole heap of negatives <laughs> and there's no positives. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no upside. There's no upside, there's a lot of downsides. So, yeah. so the average person on earth doesn't want to learn more about love mm -hmm. because their current definition of love is severely flawed. Yeah. Once I learn that my definition of love is severely flawed and want to have a desire to, to reverse that, I will then probably, after hearing some truth about love, that God is love and it's not the same as the world's love and the reality is there's no pain in real love and all this kind of thing, and it starts to appeal to my desire, yep. I will begin to develop a desire to become more loving as a result. So that's one motivation. Yep. So I could say developing desire comes through knowledge, the development of knowledge. Mm -hmm. right? And that knowledge has to be based around the truth. And this is one way we develop our will, by focusing on desire for knowledge about truth. Mm -hmm. Another way we focus on the use of our will is by looking at what prevents us from exercising our will. Fear is a major preventer of exercising our will in positive directions. Yeah. We are afraid of things. We, we are afraid of many things that we don't need to be afraid of, in fact. Now, if I learn the truth that I don't need to be afraid of it, at some point I'm going to have to feel that I don't need to be afraid of it, which is going to mean needing to deal with my feelings about the matter of what I'm afraid of. Yep. I need to use my will. I start to see the intellectual wisdom of using my will in the direction where I no longer have fear within me, that I get somehow get rid of fear. Yep. 
And so I would then need to exercise my will in that direction. So if, I'm, if I can see the truth that, that fear prevents the exercise of my will, then I'll probably develop a desire to feel my fears and release them. Yes. Right? I'll probably develop a desire to get rid of them. That's an essential part of using my will. Mm -hmm. So what I've only mentioned now is two things. The development of a desire, right, in terms of for truth. Yes. And then developing a desire to release fear, yeah. to, to, to release the error, which is all based around fear. I would also need to, at some point, develop a desire along, you know, to, f to, f to progress or grow. Now, unfortunately for most people, they don't develop a desire to grow unless they're in extreme pain. Mm. And unfortunately, pain becomes a great motivator mm. for somebody to exercise their will in a different direction. Mm. In fact, many people who have progressed on the natural love path have only begun their progress because they were in so much pain in the hills, they wanted it to stop. And then they began their progress. Yeah. So often times you can see that if we're sensitive to pain, there may be a likelihood that we'll progress, we'll use our will in a different direction, right? That we'll desire to use our will. So it makes sense then that one of the things that's going to help my will be motivated, developed, is by becoming sensitive to pain. It makes logical sense. Yeah. I need to allow myself to become sensitive to logical pain, to logically to pain, in order for myself to see the need to get out of pain, mm -hmm. and then to develop a desire to get out of pain. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm sensitive to pain, that will certainly motivate my will. So, the more sensitive I am to pain, the better it's going to be for the exercise of my will. Mm -hmm. And while we could list many more things, these are, they are just three things that we've listed so far that where we can develop our will and, and actually exercise our will, like grow it. Will is like a muscle. Yep. And it's like any muscle, it will not grow unless it is exercised. Uh, so while you remain apathetic, will cannot grow. So learn how to not be apathetic anymore. Learn to have a decision, to have a choice. Learn to actually have an opinion. It doesn't matter even if the opinion's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's better than having no opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> learn how to express your opinions. This will help the development of your will. You will soon have feedback when your opinions are out of harmony with love by God giving you this feedback through all of God's laws and you'll see when your opinions are in harmony with love, generally. Mm. But you need to engage your will to have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and that will help you develop your will further. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> engaging with uh, thoughts, feelings, opinions, desires without facade is going to help us connect to how our will is already being exercised yes. and also to strengthen it like the muscles that you mentioned. Yes. And like every, if anybody has ever done any weights exercises, they know that the more resistance that they have, the stronger the muscle they build. Mm -hmm. So they know that the more something resists you, yeah. in the case of a weight, the more you have to struggle to lift it, the more your body adapts to the new level of, of strength required to lift that particular thing. Yep. It's exactly the same kind of thing we, if we want to develop our will. We need to understand that we need to place ourselves in situations that require us to overcome resistance. Mm -hmm. right? This is one great way, taking some action now, to overcome resistance right, to the development of our will, to, to the exercise of our will. Yep. So instead of avoiding situations, which most people do, instead of avoiding the situations where people oppose us mm -hmm. and oppose the exercise of our will, we would start to engage situations where people oppose our will. And we'd still exercise our will yep. in a loving manner. Yep. And this will cause, it's like resistance to 
our, our muscles. It's like causing us to have to be stronger with our will in order to make the breakthrough. And this doesn't mean that we'd be nasty. It just means that we're strong, have to be stronger in the exercise of our will. So in situations where usually we would have a different opinion or desire to do something and we that don't is express still in it harmony and we don't with love, yep. Yep. where we usually just become passive and don't engage our will. Correct. It would be engaging our will. And exercising our will, growing it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Making sure that it's in harmony with love. If we grow it by actually engaging those situations. Yes. By actually, you know, having the confronting talk or having the situation you're afraid of, actually, you're now engaged in the situation you're afraid of. Mm -hmm. It's an exercise of your will now. You have to use your will now to overcome this thing that's opposing you. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of using your will in this regard is you're exercising it. Mm -hmm. You're realizing the great joy that can come from the exercise of your own will. And once you start feeling joy in the exercise of your own will, there's a higher likelihood that you'll further exercise your will. See, most people have had a lot of pain and suffering in the exercise of their will as, as a child, and so they have little joy in exercising their will as an adult. So what we need to do instead is allow ourselves to, have, to, to develop this joy of exercising our will by engaging confronting situations which we would normally avoid, and allow ourselves to exercise our will through the engagement of the situation. And this will exercise our will. This will grow our will. And your will needs to grow because at the end of the day, if you want to become at one with God and you want to be loving and you want to love the, everyone in the world, even though they don't love you, you're going to have to use your will <laughs> to do all of those things. Yeah. So you definitely want to learn how to grow your will. So we've been through basically four things. Now we could list many, many more things about the exercise of our will. And what we will do, with, we will have, while we've put this in the emotions frequently asked questions, the reality is it also deserves attention by itself. And so we will have, in fact, a whole series about the use of free will, the use of our will, that we'll answer questions about in the future. And we will engage more ways in which a person can grow their will rather than just remain empathetic and wait for some miracle <laughs> to come along or wait some for some saviour to come along to save them from the exercise of their own responsibility to use their own will. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah.